I'm Jakub and I want to show you how to achieve zero trust security and observability using Kong Mesh. So when you transition from monolithic application to microservices, you've got a couple of challenges that you need to overcome. The first one is traffic connectivity. Because you changed those function calls to a network calls, now you need to have service discovery in place to know where is the destination service that you are connecting to. And the second problem is that network is not reliable. So you need circuit breakers, retries, timeouts, and so on. And of course, you would like to leverage the fact that you are using microservices. So uh, you probably need some special load balancing for A-B testing, canary deployments, and so on. The second challenge is how to achieve security. Because network is not secure by default, you need to have TLS connection uh, between your services. And then there is observability. When you go with distributed systems, you need to have great observability. Otherwise, it will be really hard to troubleshoot problems. So how to solve those issues? Let me tell you a story. Before I joined Kong, I was working at the biggest e-commerce company uh, in Poland. And the, and the environment there contained almost 1,000 microservices. And I was part of the team that was building tools and systems for the application developers so they don't need to worry about such problems. And our solution for this was to just use frameworks and libraries. Because, of course, we wouldn't want to repeat the code in every application. So we just developed a library that was embedded uh, for every service that was deployed. And this solution had a couple of problems. The first one is that it was bound to one language. So majority of our services were, were written in Java, but of course the beauty of microservice architecture is that you've got communication via network. So you can uh, write the application in Rust, in Go, in whatever language you want, right? But the problem is that if you pick, for example, Rust, and this library is written in Java, then you need to uh, redone all this work. And the problem is that um, it is in the hand of application developers and they should spend time on actually uh, developing this uh, business value and features, not dealing with infrastructure. So what will happen is that they will probably want do this in the same way that uh, we as an infrastructure team did. And you miss some features. I, I've seen a situation where uh, this re-implementation of some features actually caused problem that caused outage of the whole platform. And then the second problem is how to coordinate those upgrades. Because if you want to add a new feature or you have a bug, then uh, we need to uh, release new version of the library and we need to spread this and upgrade to every application, which is really difficult process if uh, we have like hundreds of services. Then how to even enforce those rules. If we, let's say, provide really nice tools for uh, securing the traffic for MTLS, you kind of, you cannot enforce them. You cannot uh, expect that it will be used just like designed because developers can just bypass those, uh, those rules. And then uh, if you want to make a change in the environment, for example, you want to enable tracing on, on your whole environment, what will happen is that uh, you need to essentially reconfigure applications to do this, which is again, huge effort if there are couple of hundred services. So of course there is a better approach to do this and uh, we can use service mesh. So service mesh is a pattern where you develop, um, when you deploy data plane next to your service, it is a sidecar proxy. And then 
there is a control plane which is responsible for uh, sending the configuration to those data planes. So this approach has a couple of advantages. The first one is that it's language agnostic. So it doesn't matter if the service is written in Java, Rust, Go, or this can be even your monolithic application or the database. Because the communication between service and the sidecar is through network. And this gives us this nice consistency of all the features that we offloaded from the, from the libraries to the sidecar proxy, which is consistent across whole infrastructure. And then upgrades are in the hands of the infrastructure team because you don't have to uh, change applications and redeploy them. You just need to redeploy this proxy. And then it's super easy to enforce rules like MTLS because if you deploy the sidecar next to your service, you also deploy this enforcement that every traffic is going uh, through the sidecar to your service and every traffic to other service is also going through the sidecar. So if you enable MTLS, there's no way to bypass uh, this secure connection. And last but not least, uh, the policy changes are applied instantly. This is really nice feature of Envoy and KongMesh uh, is using Envoy as a sidecar proxy that you can configure this proxy in runtime without any restarts of the service itself or the applications. Okay, so let's now uh, go with the demo. I will be showing you KongMesh, which is based on Kuma, uh, an open source project uh, developed at Kong. So I provisioned uh, empty Kubernetes cluster in a cloud. Let's see, uh, I've got just cube system namespace here. Uh, and nothing else. So the first step is to deploy Kong Mesh. To do this, we can go to konghq.com to docs Kong Mesh, install Kong Mesh, Kubernetes, because we will be deploying this with Kubernetes, and we can take this script. So this script fetches the newest version of Kong Mesh for your architecture. I'm using macOS, so the binaries will be compatible with macOS here. And we see four binaries here, actually five. Uh, but for this demo and for dealing with Kubernetes, we will be using just Kuma Cattle because uh, the CP and data plane will be fetched from the uh, Docker repository. So to install Kong Mesh, you execute uh, Kuma Cattle install control plane. You pass the path for the license file and you pipe this to Kube Cattle apply to apply on your Kubernetes cluster. So this Kuma Cattle commands actually produces the list of YAML files with deployment, service, CRDs, uh, all this stuff to get Kong Mesh to work. And let's see our pods and control plane is running. So let's do port forward uh, service Kuma control plane on port 5681. And this is the port for the API and for the GUI as well. So we can access Kong Mesh GUI. Here we can see that we've got one zone. This is a standalone deployment, which means that we have only one Kubernetes cluster, but you can also deploy Kong Mesh with a multi-zone deployment with many Kubernetes clusters, with many different clouds, with hybrid environments like virtual machines, containers, and Kubernetes. Uh, but here we are using only one zone, standalone. And we see also one mesh. So the mesh is, re is the representation of one service mesh you can use one Kong Mesh control plane to manage many different separated service meshes. So as you can see, MTLS is disabled as well as metrics and tracing. So this is just a simple empty mesh definition. Okay, uh, we also see that there are no data planes right now. So let's deploy demo application. For the demo application, I will be using uh, Kuma demo 
you can access this in uh, at our GitHub repository, Kuma HQ Kuma demo. And this demo application uh, has four components. Front-end application that communicates with the back-end API that communicates with Postgres and Redis. So four components. Let's see our Kuma demo pods. Okay, you can see four pods here. And next to every container in every pod, there is a Kong mesh sidecar. We can see two containers here. So let's go to the Kong mesh GUI, to data planes, and we can see four data planes that are online and connected. So every data plane has a set of tags that you can later use um, in policies in Kong mesh. Okay, so let's access our demo application. We can port forward Kuma demo service front end on port 8080. And we can see uh, our marketplace demo application. There is a list of items here, uh, which is fetched from Postgres. And there are also reviews that are fetched from the Redis database. Okay, so now that we've got application and Kong Mesh, let's secure the connection between services. And to do this, uh, we can go to kuma.io, explore policies, and here is the list of the stuff that you can do with Kong Mesh. So let's go to MTLS. And here we see the mesh definition. So now with the mesh, we see the MTLS section with the list of backends. We've got only one backend here named CA1 and the type is built-in. The built-in means that Kong Mesh will provision for your certificate authority, which will be then used to generate certificates for all the data planes in a mesh. And also we can see that the expiration for the data plane certificate is one day which means that Kong Mesh will take care of rotating those certificates for you. So let's take this definition and edit our default mesh that we already have in the cluster. Okay, and let's save this. We can go back to Kong Mesh GUI just to make sure that our default mesh has now MTLS enabled. Okay, let's go back then to our demo application. Let's refresh. And we see that the application does not uh, work. It's because uh, when you enable MTLS, all the traffic is restricted by default. So you need to explicitly enable the connection between services. And to do this, uh, let's go to kuma.io, explore policies again, but this time traffic permissions. And with traffic permissions, here is the policy that helps you define the connections that are allowed in a mesh. So we can say that all the connection, all the connections that originate from the data planes that matches this list of tags, here we are saying kuma.io service and wildcard, which means that every data plane will match. And if the connection is to the data plane with, again, kuma.io service wildcard, it means that connection is allowed. And we apply this on the default mesh. So essentially, we are allowing every service to communicate with every service, but of course, it will still require MTLS. You could do, uh, you could specify that front-end can only communicate with back-end and back-end only can communicate with Redis and Postgres and so on. So you can have more granular uh, rules for the traffic permissions. Okay, let's apply this on cluster via kubectl apply. And let's go back to the Kong Mesh GUI. Uh, let's go to traffic permissions. And now we see this traffic permission that we just applied. Here is the YAML. Now let's go back to the application, let's refresh, and the application works again, but this time every connection is secured by MTLS. So 
just like this with three simple steps, deploy on the mesh, configure MTOS on the mesh, and enable traffic with traffic permissions, we introduce security on top of our current deployment. Okay, so next let's uh, introduce observability. To do this, we can go to explore policies again, traffic metrics, and as a first step, let's deploy Prometheus and Grafana. And to deploy Prometheus and Grafana, we could use Kumakatl install metrics and pipe this to kubectl apply. So just like we did with Kumakatl install control plane, now we are installing Prometheus, Grafana, and it is configured uh, for the mesh discovery with a default dashboards for Kong mesh. Now, the second step is to uh, apply metrics on a mesh. So again, we have this mesh object here, and there is a section called metrics instead of MTLS. And again, we have a list of backends here, and the backend named Prometheus1 of the type Prometheus, and we are enabling this backend here. So let's take this definition and edit our default mesh, and let's put this next to MTLS. Okay, we can go back to Kong Mesh GUI, to meshes, and we see that metrics are now enabled on the mesh. Okay, so let's see our deployment of metrics. It is running, so we can port forward uh, Kuma metrics and service Grafana on port 3000. And let's access Grafana. But also let's do this uh, a step back. Let's go back to this ap demo application. And I get this nice extension to Google Chrome that can refresh this page every second. So we actually generate some traffic so we can see this on our dashboards. Let's log in with the default username and password admin admin. And we can skip the password change and we see three dashboards here. So first let's look at the Kuma mesh dashboard. This is the overview for the whole mesh. So you can see how many data planes are connected. We see nine because Prometheus and Grafana is, uh, are also part of the mesh. And we see connections to the control plane and bytes that are flow flowing through Envoy. Uh, we don't see any health checks because we are not using health checks right now. And also we can see that there are no errors here. So that's the Kuma mesh dashboard that gives you this nice overview for the whole mesh. But if you want to inspect one instance, you can try um, this Kuma data plane dashboard. So let's pick, um, let's pick Kuma demo backend. And we see that the data plane is alive for eight minutes. It is connected to the control plane. It has active connection and some traffic that is coming in because we are generating this traffic here. And for the outgoing traffic, we see connection to Postgres and Redis, and also we see the traffic to Postgres. Uh, we can see no errors here, and uh, also the connections to Redis and Postgres are protected by MTLS. So we can just inspect one instance of the service. But at the same time, you may want to inspect the traffic between services. Because if you have many instances, for example, of service backend, and you have many instances of Postgres, you can see this dashboard with aggregated traffic from those data planes. So again, we see active connections and traffic errors, health checks, and so on. So with three steps, we added more observability into your deployment. First, we installed Prometheus and Grafana. We configured Grafana and Prometheus uh, to discover Kuma, but, we, but it was covered by Kuma Cattle install metrics. And also we configured mesh with 
matrix settings. Okay, and we can go even extra mile and introduce tracing. To introduce tracing, we can go back to explore policies and this time traffic trace. But of course, the first step is to install the system that will collect those traces for us. So let's use Kumakatu again, but this time let's do install tracing. And install tracing installs Jagger cluster for you. So that's the first step. Second step is to configure mesh with tracing. So just like we had MTLS and metrics, now we have tracing section and we have list of backends here. Uh, the backend that we will be using is the type zip team, which is compatible with Yager. And we name this Yager collector. We say that we want to sample every single request. And the URL is the default URL of the Yager that we are deploying on the cluster right now. So let's take this tracing section of the mesh and edit our default mesh. And we put this next to metrics and MTLS. So that's the second step. And the first step, third step is to apply traffic trace policy. So the traffic trace policy helps you pick the subset of the data planes that you would like to um, report those traces to a tracing system. So here we are, we are saying that all the data planes that matches those stacks, which again, uh, this means that every data plane will match because we have a wide card here in a default mesh. So all of those data planes will be sending traces to a Yager collector backend. So let's take this definition and apply this on a cluster via just kubectl apply. Now let's go back to the Kong mesh GUI. We can refresh meshes and we see Zipkin here and the other collector. And now if we go to traffic traces, we see the traffic trace policy with the YAML that we just applied on the system. Okay, let's see now our Kuma tracing pods and Yager is deployed on a cluster. We can port forward this, Kuma tracing service Yager query on port 1990. And if we access this, we see the Yager GUI. And there are two services here, frontend and backend. Uh, let's inspect uh, those traces. We can take, let's see, this one. And we see that the um, request for the front end took um, 13 milliseconds almost. And the majority of this time was spent on the request that was being processed by backend. So you may ask why we don't see here Postgres and Redis because this is part of our system. And it's because uh, Postgres and Redis are using just TCP and for tracing, we need to pass some headers, therefore we need HTTP. And there are also some informations like the URL that uh, we are using, um, status code, and so on. So with three steps, we introduced tracing in our deployment. We first installed Yager on the cluster, then we configured Yager in the mesh, and then we specified which data planes will be reporting to this tracing backend. 